I'm actually saying it's more like 180 now, and I'm actually relatively serious, you know, relatively, 90% serious. So, um, without further ado, thank you, Paul. Thank you. For arriving thank just you, Roger. from Canada today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my neighbor was over the other day and, you know, he was asking me, so, I don't know, everybody's getting old in the neighborhood and he's like, well, how long do you think you're going to live? And I said, oh, probably between 180 and 250 years. And he's like, oh, yeah, right, right. And I'm like, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, we are on the cusp of uh, some incredible breakthroughs in, in technology and understanding human physiology uh, and the the bioactive uh, systems inside of the body uh, and using technologies like this that we're going to talk about today uh, it's sort of like the uh, the future of where we're going with with medicine so uh, the old model of the the pharmaceutical model where everything was chemistry based uh, we're really starting to learn that the energetics have a, a lot bigger of a role to play and if you look at uh, TV shows, futuristic shows like Star Trek and that, it's very similar to uh, the technology that they all use in there. You know, they have the replicator where you turn on a, a, a unit that looks like a microwave and it and does a 3D print of your food. Uh, then you have uh, Bones with his tricorder and he diagnoses you and treats you in two different zaps of his little machine. Um, I really see that that's, that's kind of where we're heading with this kind of technology. And it's really exciting to be to be working on this but uh, so how many people have seen some of our YouTube talks or been to some of the other presentations mm -hmm. okay so I'll just I'll cover a little bit of what we've been talking about before but a lot of people haven't seen the the history so we're gonna go a little bit into the history uh, starting with the ancient Greeks and uh, and then go up to today and, and where we're going from here so electricity itself uh, we get the word uh, electricity from electron. Uh, the Greeks called amber electra. And uh, they noticed that you'd find this uh, stuff washed up on the beaches. And what it is, it's actually fossilized resin from ancient trees, uh, millions of years old, that have been buried in the ocean and end up getting washed up onto shore. And uh, so people use it for jewelry and things like that. But when you rub it against uh, a piece of wool or some other organic material, it cr creates electrostatic charge. And so that's why they called it electra, and we uh, evolved our whole uh, electronic uh, concepts and, and, and theories from starting with, with the amber. And um, they actually used it uh, electricity back then too. Uh, so electricity, ever since its discovery and we've been able to harness it, we saw, you know, uh, lightning and man's always w wished that he could harness the power of electricity so we've actually used electricity uh, for healing uh, for for a long time since ancient Greek times now these don't look like they're having too much fun these guys here they got electric eels in the tanks down here and electric fish that they're zapping people with uh, one of the more popular stories you hear especially in America about electricity was that uh, you know, Benjamin Flank Franklin in uh, 1752 captured the lightning with uh, down on the string from his uh, a kite flying in the rain. And what he actually was doing was he was capturing the electricity in a little jar down at the bottom here. It's called a, a Leiden jar. And it's basically a capacitor. And it has a, uh, the ability to store charge differential between the center pin and this outside uh, metal jacket. And it's basically like a battery. These were the first batteries, and you've probably seen the Baghdad batteries. Uh, in ancient times, the ancient Egyptians were electroplating gold. Uh, so we had a lot of technology in the early times in the, what we call like the builder races in ancient times. Uh, we're able to utilize electricity as well, but it's kind of got uh, lost in, in, in history and we've forgotten all about it. Uh, and then in the s later in the 1700s uh, along came this fellow, uh, Luigi uh, Galvani. And he was the one that experimented with frog legs in the laboratory and he, as he was dissecting frogs, he found that when he prodded the, the, the frog legs with a brass uh, scalpel and a pick, that somehow it triggered a response in the frog leg and the muscles would actually twitch. 
so he was the first one to discover that the bioactive uh, fields that corresponded with biology and electricity. Uh, so he's uh, given credit to all the bioelectric uh, devices we have today. Now, most of the devices we have today we use for diagnostics. So we're doing MRIs and X-rays and things like this to look at the body, but what we're not really using electricity for is doing treatments. And back in these early uh, 1800s, uh, we were doing quite a bit of uh, work with treating with, with electricity. So uh, here he's got set up in his laboratory sort of a Van de Graaff uh, generator where you turn the crank, creates a static charge, and it would zap these different pieces of the frogs and make their arms twitch and stuff. And Galvani said, you know, this is the vital uh, force of God. It's, it's the energy of God, that the life force that's moving throughout this organic tissue to animate life. And so he was really curious about that. And uh, so he did a lot of experiments. Uh, here he's hanging the frog legs and during a lightning storm to see the reaction to just the general ambience of the static electricity. And uh, he was at a fellow uh, this is a fellow professor that was at the same university that he was teaching at, um, uh, Volta, and we get the word Volt from his name, and he, he kind of set out to prove um, Galvani wrong because he thought, well, you know, it's got to be something more science-based than this idea of just sort of God having this universal life force that's electricity. There must be something more rational to, to explaining what electricity is. And that inspired him to come up with the voltaic pile, which is basically a battery. So you take a copper plate and a nickel plate or another dissimilar metal, and you have an insulator in between them, and you saturate it with an alkaline or an acidic solution, and you get basically what we use as battery, common batteries today. So these were the very first batteries. So the, the Leiden jars that you saw at the beginning, they could hold a charge, but for a ver very brief time. Whereas these uh, batteries were capable of, of having a charge for a long time, and we're still using them today with uh, like lithium ions or the advanced batteries, so-called advanced batteries of today. Uh, but they still take a long time to charge up and a long time to discharge. And where we're going with this sort of end of te technology is uh, going to be light years ahead of where we are right now. Tesla's planning on building these big uh, power supplies, you know, the Tesla wall that you're going to be able to put in your house. And they're talking about getting the electron density uh, down in the battery so you'll be able to charge batteries very quickly and discharge them over long periods of time. And uh, we're sort of doing some work on that right now. And uh, I think you're going to be pretty surprised in the next couple of years, the batteries that are going to come online made out of things like glass and carbon. You can literally grind these batteries up and throw them in your garden and grow plants with them. So there's no environmental uh, problems with them. Uh, and you'll be able to charge your car in a half an hour and drive for 12 hours on that half an hour charge. But that's a bit of a sidetrack. So these are the kind of technologies that uh, mm -hmm. we're working with on a daily basis. But uh, back then, uh, so once this word got out, all kinds of papers started coming out about these uh, effects of electricity and how they could do a lot of healing effects. This particular paper is on curing headaches uh, with, uh, with electricity and they came up with a lot of crazy contraptions where you lie in this bathtub and they charge up the bathtub with thousands of volts and you'd have like this corona going around you. Uh, bit, of, bit of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it actually worked, and, and uh, the, you know, this is a thesis from somebody in France in 1870. Uh, so I'm a bit of a bibliophile, and I collect a lot of these old medical books, and when you look at around the late 1800s, early 1900s, every single medical uh, book had several chapters on using electricity for therapeutic purposes. And some of the machines that came out back then uh, were similar to this. It basically ran on uh, Volta's pile there, uh, the battery, and you held on to these rods and this little oscillator in here, which is based on a uh, Tesla coil, who we'll get into in a little bit, uh, gave you a bit of a zap. And so these were the first zappers. Everybody's kind of familiar with the Hulda Clark kind of zappers. Uh, Hulda Clark wrote a book called uh, 
uh, cure for all cancers and uh, she talked about using uh, these Zapper technologies to target specific uh, different ailments and, and particularly cancer. So these became quite popular, even well-known companies like Champion uh, were building these things. Uh, they were used, you could buy them in the, like this uh, Sears Roebuck uh, catalog and they had all kinds of different attachments uh, for them. And uh, so I also collect these, this is called a violet ray uh, system and they started working with uh, plasmas. These, so these were sort of the first plasma wands. And basically it's that same Tesla coil again. Uh, with these tubes that are filled with noble gases and different tubes for different orifices and things like that and uh, they were actually uh, using them for all kinds of different skin conditions. Uh, it generates a lot of ozone when you turn these on and they get these really bright, you know, ultraviolet kind of uh, frequencies coming off of them. So whenever you put it on your skin, it completely sterilizes, kills bacteria and viruses right on contact instantly so they were really good for a lot of different skin conditions and things like that here's the one of the tubes lit up and I actually got an email the other day people uh, have their own therapy have all been doing their own little experiments and I got an email from a fellow uh, the other day who got one and he took his violet ray tube and he was just holding it out in the field here uh, we'll talk a bit about the field and, and spin tronics and, and what's actually happening with the therapy but you hold one of these violet ray tubes, you know, at a distance from about here, and you'll see the plasma start to spin in it and just wirelessly lights up. So this is how Tesla was doing his wireless power transmission. Uh, the whole device is based on uh, some of these early uh, devices as, as well as Tesla's work. So here's one of the ads that you could see. You could send away for these things for a couple bucks and uh, all kinds of medical doctors were using them at that time. Uh, you know, here's a particular situation, he's got the patient there and he's uh, treating some kind of skin condition or something like this. And then uh, there's this fellow, uh, Sir William Crooks, and he invented the Crooks tube, which became uh, basically a you know, cathode ray tube. So I think everybody's here old enough to remember the old television sets with the big tubes in there, that, that's a cathode ray tube. And that tube became the heart of uh, television, uh, electronic devices, oscilloscopes, and anything that needed a projector, computer monitors. And for years we made these big honking tubes. And these were some of the early models. So uh, what he found was he'd, he'd basically put a high voltage DC source on these tubes and when he put in some kind of metal thing, it would interfere with the pattern, uh, with, the, with the plasma inside there and create a pattern on the screen. So this was like the very first television set. And so you can see the similarity in the tubes. So especially these early tubes, uh, I kind of based on the Crooks tube uh, with a twist, with several twists. And we'll, we'll get into the twisting in a little bit. Uh, and so Crooks was sort of a mentor for Tesla and everybody today knows uh, many stories about Tesla. I'm sure we won't get into too much about it. But of course he lived and worked right here uh, in Manhattan and on Long Island. And he said if you want to find the secrets of the universe you have to think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. And in my opinion all this, this experience that we're having here is purely electrical phenomena. When you get down to the core of chemistry, physics, biology, it's all about the charge. So, you know, for instance, they say when you look at a, a very small particle uh, like an atom, and the Greeks again came up with that name, they said it's the smallest undividable uh, unit of matter. Uh, of course, they had no idea what an atom r really was. Or, or did they? We're not too sure at this point because a lot of this stuff lost in obscurity. You've got to remember that the Greeks were going around and being educated by in ancient Egypt at the decline of the ancient Egyptian civilization. So they got the last remnants of knowledge and that became what made you know, the Greek wisdom so, so powerful. So people like uh, Plato and, and Socrates and stuff, they were studying what was left of the ancient 
Egyptian civilization. And at that time, it was very much in decline. And even the Egyptians did not really know their real history. When you look at a lot of the uh, stones that they had, many of those stones were cut by machines. And I've seen, you know, perfect bowls that are only a few millimeters uh, thick, like a vase. And you can see the tooling marks that are cutting them. And it's one piece of stone. And, you know, they preserved them. They said, yeah, we don't know how our ancestors did these, but they were able to carve these amazing pieces of stone uh, with some kind of technology. And you go there and you look at some of these massive pieces of rocks with uh, saw marks that are cut in them, and you measure the arc on, the, on this saw blade that's obviously cut the stone. And you do the math and you figure out the saw blade that they were running was something like 15 meters, you know, like 60 feet in diameter. And so obviously it was some kind of massive machine that was, was doing this. So a lot of these, uh, you know, people who were sort of the frontiers of modern, uh, modern science around this time, uh, they were also looking back into ancient times to understand what, what people were doing. Uh, and Tesla built this laboratory and he found that he could sit inside of these really highly excited uh, streams of plasma, uh, millions of volts of potential across these coils in his laboratory in, uh, in Wardenclyffe and uh, on Long Island and in uh, Colorado Springs in Colorado. And he noticed that he basically barely slept. He stayed up in the laboratory all the time. Uh, he would have people that would come over. He was good friends with uh, a lot of famous people and uh, like Samuel Clemens and like everybody knows is Mark Twain and a lot of famous people would just come to Tesla's uh, laboratory just to hang out and feel the healing energies uh, from a lot of the, the technologies that he was working on. And uh, so Tesla of course became responsible for alternating current, uh, the electric motor, he was doing wireless transmissions. He built the first remote control submarine, uh, all kinds of light technology and wireless transmission. And so at the heart of the Therify is pure Tesla technology. Inside the big black box at the bottom is, is a very unique uh, coil by Tesla. It's covered in, in some of his patents um, several times. So. That's sort of the, the heart of the Therify. And then these tubes uh, are filled with noble gases and they're similar to the Crookes tube. And then it has a very special amplifier that integrates the whole system and controls all the frequencies that run into it. So uh, Tesla said electric power is everywhere, present in unlimited quantities and can drive the world's machinery without the need for coal, oil or gas or any other of the common fuels. Of course, his concept with the Wardenclyffe Tower that was out on Long Island, uh, this thing was a massive uh, tower that went up into the air and it had a huge collector on the top. So what we would call sort of a, a top load uh, capacitor. So it was basically a metal structure of metal balls up there and then underneath there was a well and it ran deep into the, into the ground, down to the salt water in the ocean. So this was the ground plate. He used the actual earth as the ground plane, and then his transmitter that he could transmit with his tower. And then, so what he was doing, he got funded to, to do this uh, radio broadcast. And earlier on from this stage, uh, he had a friend named uh, Marconi. And he basically gave Marconi the, some of the original radio circuits and said, you know, this is a good way to transmit signals. Why don't you go off and play with this? And Tesla was getting funding to build this tower. But what he really wasn't telling his sponsors, uh, that he was planning to transmit electricity, collect electricity with this. So it would collect static electricity from the atmosphere. And basically, instead of lightning pulsing uh, and discharging to the Earth, it would collect in this tower and then he could retransmit it. So all you would need instead of running wires uh, and, and having power lines come to your house and somebody putting a meter and you paying a monthly power bill, all you would need is a little miniature version of this tower on the roof of your house and you would receive the electricity for free. 
And uh, when his backers found that out, of course, at that time, they were buying up all the copper mines and getting into stretching wire all over the, the country. And they saw big profits in selling everybody electricity. Uh, when they found out that this was Tesla's plan, they kiboshed the whole project and, and tore down the, the tower. Uh, so another contemporary of Tesla's who is a little known uh, uh, brilliant genius was uh, Walter Russell. And uh, Walter Russell was an interesting character. He was an artist and uh, one day he was out in a field and he got hit by lightning and he went into a coma for days and they didn't think he was going to make it. And when he came around, he, he was in the hospital and he started talking about all this idea of how the universe worked and how every, all the elements are created and elements on the periodic table and he saw these visions of how electricity actually worked because nobody really understood electricity they were really trying at that time uh, and he came up with this book called the universal one and in this book he he kind of wrote uh, all these ideas down on, on, on paper and the doctors at the time they thought he'd gone insane they're ready to lock him up they're like well I don't know he's stable enough to you know go out into the world and, and, and live his life okay so we'll just let him go and he wrote this book now at this time the periodic table looked like this but in Walter Russell's book this is how he drew the periodic table in a complete spiral. So if you look at this table here, it has all the elements on the periodic table that we know today. And then you see the noble gases across here uh, dividing everything at the uh, ninth octave. And this table filled in all the blanks, all the different elements that we didn't know about, even some of the isotopes like uh, deuterium and tritium isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, he had harmonic nodes on there because they all fit into uh, geometry. And so that's another component to the Therify is it's all based on geometry. And we don't give geometry enough credit, but when we'll see in, in, in a little bit here, geometry has everything to do with frequency. And so he was able to lie uh, all the elements and put a whole lot of information on here and of course, uh, it sort of evolved into the, to the modern periodic table. But Walter kind of had this concept of how matter came into existence and how it could transmute into other elements. Of course, the modern uh, theory is that all the elements came, come from the Big Bang and this is it, this is what we got. These things aren't dynamic in any way unless you go into uh, nuclear isotopes and then then they're transmuting uh, but at that time uh, nobody was really aware they were just sort of working on atomic weapons at that point so interestingly enough he sent a copy of that book around uh, to he printed a thousand copies he sent them to all these major universities around the world um, and nobody, nobody replied back to him. So people like Einstein and Niels Bohr and Schrodinger, all these guys got a copy of it. But only one person replied back to him. You know who that was? Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Tesla replies back to him and he says, Walter, I think you should take that book and bury it for a thousand years because humanity is not ready for this information yet. And uh, so, this is a, a one of the images from there, and, and basically this is how the Therify is utilizing uh, the waveforms that are coming off of each of these tubes. Um, probably some of you are familiar with Dan Winter's uh, talks. He's been promoting geometry and talking about uh, these technologies for, for many years now. And, uh, so it's started all this whole Therify started with Dan's uh, algorithm uh, which has to do with Planck's length and phi ratio and these are things that we see in nature so all the quantum mechanics is based on uh, this very small unit of measure uh, called Planck's length and everything that we see in nature is based on this golden uh, ratio that we see uh, 1.618039 ad infinitum. It's a, an infinite number. 
uh, but we see these repeating patterns over and over again in plants and in animals and trees and everywhere. Uh, so another uh, person who uh, was uh, meeting with Tesla at that time is this George Lakovsky. And Lakovsky uh, came up with this machine based on Tesla's coils called the multi-wave oscillator. And basically, it was a series of Tesla coils that were connected to these concentric rings. And uh, these rings lit up with plasma, and you basically uh, sat in between the two of them. And uh, he, was, he was Russian, he lived in Europe, and he came over here, uh, met with Tesla, came up with this machine and wrote several papers how he believed that this multi-wave oscillator was affecting right down uh, through the mitochondria, right down to the DNA level inside of the cells. And he wrote several papers on uh, its effects on the DNA. Uh, they began using it in hospitals right here in New York. They ran uh, several trials and found great success with many different diseases. And then uh, he unfortunately got hit by three men in black suits in a black sedan and uh, he died and uh, right after he died they totally took them out of the hospitals and removed it and wiped it from the record, destroyed all the papers and documentation. Uh, there was a couple in Europe at that time that continued on for uh, a few years later. So that would have been 1942. That was the year before Tesla died in the next year, 1943. Uh, and that was about the time that everything sort of went hush with all this technology. So it's all based on uh, plasma. And plasma is, you know, you may have heard that the universe is made up of plasma, 99% plasma. It's also 99% hydrogen. So when you look out there at the stars, uh, all the stars, and plasma is not, you know, some, uh, you know, thing that we don't really uh, know about or see. It's, it's what the stars are. It's what's inside of these lights, you know, your compact fluorescence, uh, fluorescent tubes. That's all plasma inside of there. It's basically photons uh, being excited by electricity. So uh, as the outer orbital uh, shells of different elements, mostly the noble gases like that are in here in, in, in neon signs, they get hit with uh, bombarded with electricity and they get excited. And those outer shells, when, they, when the electrons jump those outer shells, uh, it gives off a photon. And if you hit it with UV light, then they'll absorb a photon. That's the way solar voltaic panels work, is they're absorbing the light and converting the light to electricity. So you can use electricity to make light in, in both directions. And this is basically what the, what the universe is made up of and how the whole universe is operating. It's all light. Uh, so the ancient philosophers and the New Age people that you say, it's my light body and we're all light beings, it's absolutely true. When you uh, take your physical body, and there was a fellow called Fritz Popp who was taking biological matter in a completely dark room, and it's really, really hard to get a completely isolated dark room. We're talking walls that are six feet thick with very special materials to block out every single light. And you measure photonic emission from the body. And so your cells in your body is actually generating light and you can measure it in, in these highly, with highly sensitive uh, uh, pieces of equipment in these rooms. And uh, so you've all seen the Renaissance sort of paintings and, and the ancient Eastern paintings with Buddhas and, and Jesus and angels and they all have the halo around their head. Now, quite literally, you can concentrate enough Chi, because it's really what, what this whole thing is, what, what's being stimulated here and created with the Therify and these other technologies. And this light force is really what the ancients have called prana, chi, all this vital life force. So you can accumulate enough of that in your body that you'll actually glow like that. And uh, so the reason why they painted those halos around those people is because when they've got that much energy inside of them, you, you literally glow. And so this is a very simple model that most likely isn't really the way it is, but this is the way we are taught these days, is that 
you have a, a proton in the center and then this electron spinning around the outside, which now they're saying it's more an electron cloud, but you have a highly positively uh, charged particle in the center of this. This would be a hydrogen atom with just a single proton in there. And so 99% of the universe is also hydrogen. Uh, of course, we know that hydrogen makes up two of the uh, um, two of the atoms inside of a water molecule, so you have oxygen bound to two hydrogen atoms, and you everybody's big on to water these days and understanding uh, a lot more. And it's an amazing mystery that we still don't understand many things about water. Recently, there's a professor in Washington. Uh, State University uh, uh, professor Gerald Pollack who wrote this book called The Fourth uh, State of Water and uh, uh, and it's really a, a, a brilliant work because he's explaining what's happening with with water in, in, in so many ways and so I've worked with water for several years and it has a lot of really unique properties in that it's a dipole it has a positive and negative charge in the water molecule itself and it's capable of forming all kinds of different geometries because these bond angles between the hydrogen and the oxygen are very sensitive to frequencies and resonant systems like this. So many people who have therapies around the world now are finding that, uh, that you can just simply take a bucket of water and put it in the center of the therapy and charge it up for 10 minutes and you water your plants with it and the plants grow like crazy. They go ballistic. Uh, so what you're actually doing is you're changing these angles because you're charging up the water and you're creating all kinds of different micro clusters inside of the water uh, and energizing the water uh, to, to make the plants grow really well. So it has a lot to do with your body. Uh, when you look at your body and they say, oh yeah, you're, when you're born you're like 70, 80 percent water and as you get older you lose a lot of water. And uh, so the water inside of your body is really responsible for all kinds of cellular respiration, uptake, and uh, elimination of all kinds of different things. And the water is actually what makes the DNA. So water forms in little tetrahedral fields that all stack together like Lego blocks that allow the proteins to fall into place to, to, to create the, the DNA. So another fellow on the west coast now in San Diego that was around at this time uh, is Royal Raymond Reif. Uh, so he's the other uh, person who had a lot of influence on the Therify machine. I've been building Reif type machines, I guess, since the late 90s. And so that's how I kind of got started into building uh, plasma tubes and working with various frequencies uh, to affect the body. Uh, um, and Royal Reif was one of my early heroes. And he was a, another little known character in history. Uh, when I first heard about him, I'm like, I said to myself, you know, same with Tesla, because when I was a kid and I went to the library, of course, everybody knew about Edison. He invented the light bulb and all this stuff, which he didn't really, he stole it from the World's Fair in France. And, uh, you know, nobody had ever heard of uh, Tesla. He kind of got swept under the rug, and a lot of these characters did. And Royal Rife really, really did. Uh, because what he was doing in the early 1900s was amazing. He built this universal microscope. Uh, he was good friends with Carl Zeiss. And uh, Zeiss built all the optics for this uh, microscope. And he had various different versions of it. And he worked in the laboratory. And what he s saw in this microscope, because he could see beyond the theoretical minimum of wavelengths of light, was he could actually see living uh, viruses and bacteria uh, that today we can't even see that fine. We have to use an electron scanning microscope to see down to those very small sizes. And you end up killing uh, anything that's alive, of course, when you st stain the slide and, and beam it with electrons. Uh, but Reif was able to see it in action and he isolated what he said was the cause of uh, all cancers. And he said there are two different viruses, BX and BY, he named them. And so he cultured those viruses in the laboratory and uh, he, 
he, uh, he injected them into rats and he grew tumors in these rats, like big tumors, equal in weight to the size of the rat. And then he would surgically uh, operate on them, cut out the tumor, and then he would treat them with his uh, radio frequencies that he was transmitting into plasma tubes. This was his grand masterpiece called the Universal Microscope. This thing had like 2,000 moving parts in it. Uh, it he was a brilliant uh, machinist and engineer. And um, there's rumor that the Smithsonian has uh, one of these microscopes. Uh, there was a couple pieces that all got scattered around the world over the years and some people tried to put them uh, back together. Uh, but nobody's really got a full working microscope to this day. And what happened is he really made the headlines because at that time uh, the, the American Medical Association was just being formed and he said he had this uh, cancer cure that he was working on and he was interested in using human subjects for it so they gave him 13 terminally <laughs> ill uh, cancer patients and he completely cured all 13 of them. They had a, this is the machine here, is he had all this huge RF equipment and this big plasma tube. And of course he is looking on, at the slides and, under the microscope. So they had a big dinner and a big celebration and uh, you know, celebrating the cure for cancer. And of course, what was happening at that time was the pharmaceutical model was really becoming the, the next big thing because all these companies that were formerly making chemical warfare weapons in Germany and uh, you know nasty things like that uh, they started you know they ran out of business because there was no war so they started making these uh, chemicals for, for uh, human consumption and, and, and treating disease. Now they've done a lot of great things I'm not totally dissing the whole pharmaceutical uh, industry or the medical industry at all but uh, it was kind of a shame of what happened to a lot of these really cutting-edge thinkers around that time. And basically what they did was they, they threatened any medical doctor that had one of these machines, and there were several of them all over North America, uh, and they said, you got to give up that machine or we'll take away your license to practice. And so they did, and they went, uh, they went all over North America and confiscated these machines and destroyed them tied up rife in the courts in all kinds of different court cases and basically ran him into the ground and he died a poor broken man and his technology never got heard of uh, ever again and then at that same time all this electromedical stuff got written out of the textbooks and we never heard anything about using electricity uh, in the health field unless it was for diagnostics so uh, the, the X-ray, who was, again was one of Tesla's inventions, uh, became very popular and now we have MRIs and EKGs and EEGs and all these kind of things. But we're not using them for, for treating, we're just using for diagnostics. So then in France, the same uh, technology sort of popped up again. And this was uh, Anton Priori in, in, in France. He was a naval uh, radio engineer and he was doing some experiments in the laboratory and one day he noticed that his lunch had fallen behind the laboratory bench and all the fruit that was in there next to his big uh, tubes that he was working on never went bad and he's like oh well, this is interesting There's some some kind of frequency or something that I've been working with here has kept these bananas from from rotting for days uh, so he worked on this massive uh, plasma machine with tons of uh, really powerful RF equipment and he was generating huge magnetic fields and then combining those magnetic fields inside of these massive plasma tubes. Now this is a small one, you can see somebody standing up behind there. Uh, some of the tubes literally went up to the second, third story in the building. They had to fly them in with a helicopter and put them in place and, and, and the patient kind of laid here on the bed on the bottom. And uh, so the French government put millions of dollars into it and they did all kinds of research and they were, had well documented cases of all kinds of diseases they had reversed and, um, and several instances of cancer being cured. And again, it was sort of just suddenly disappeared this technology and nobody ever heard of uh, Priori or, or what, uh, 
what his story was that never really made the the big news all around the world uh, that it should have. So what these uh, plasmas are is really the perfect fractal antenna. And uh, fractals are uh, sort of these repeating patterns that everybody's familiar with nowadays. When they first came on the scene and people like Mandelbrot and that were writing these equations well before we had computers, uh, science was looking at them and they were saying, yeah, it forms this sort of uh, looping infinite kind of pattern that can just carry on forever. But it, do it really doesn't mean anything and it has no real significance or importance. And it wasn't until we got computers functioning fast enough to add some color and some dimension to these algorithms and then all of a sudden out on the computer screen you put in the this simple algorithm and this spits out. And it was like, holy smokes, wow, there's something really amazing here. Because as you zoom in further and further and further, you see this pattern repeat and repeat. Of course, this is like sort of the central theme for all our CGI today that, you know, when you get into these things, you'll see mountains and shorelines and forests and trees and plants and, and everything. So everything in the universe is fractal. And it all corresponds to very simple patterns. These, these algorithms seem to re reappear over and over again. And uh, the one I talked about earlier is the, the phi ratio. And this is this golden mean spiral that is present in, in all, all kinds of things. Uh, here in a, in a sunflower, um, here in this Romanesco, this is a, probably the most fractal plant <laughs> in the, and, you, and you can eat it. This stuff is amazing. Uh, if you ever seen it, those, those things just repeat and repeat and repeat. Um, and then, uh, so this is some photos from uh, a fellow named Hans uh, Jenny who was doing this work with water and with very small particles and he found that resonances and sounds produced all these geometries. And so, like I said earlier, that geometries are basically the most important thing about geometry is how they encapsulate frequency. This is what we call uh, shape power. Mm -hmm. And uh, many different uh, shapes have different um, properties. So everybody knows you know, that crystals have different healing powers and different kinds of crystals have all these energies because the geometries in them are all various different modalities that resonate with particular patterns. And uh, there's an alchemical saying, we're at the Alchemy Kitchen, we should talk a little bit about alchemy here, but one of the most uh, famous alchemical axioms from uh, Hermes Trismegistus in the Emerald Tablet is, as it is above, so it is below. And as it is below, uh, so it is above. And so what we live in is this fractal uh, recursive uh, patterns that uh, include all these geometries. And they repeat over and over again. And they all have resonance with each other. So it's really all about resonance. And what we're doing with the Therify is we're creating all these, using all these harmonic frequencies that you find in nature to harmonize the body and basically create a bioactive field that every cell in the body sort of resonates with. It's kind of like, I call it, one of my nicknames is a human battery charger. And it gives every single cell in your body a little micro massage. And what that's doing is assisting with the cellular uh, respiration, uh, but it's creating a, a balancing field where the cells in your body are responding to it and one of the theories that uh, Guy Obolinsky and several people talk about is this time reversal wave. And what, what they're really saying in this theory of time reversal is that you're bringing things into coherence. So this idea of entropy and that everything is falling apart and the whole uh, universe, this is the standard model of science. And when they, you talk about people and they're like always slamming their fist, it's second law of thermodynamics and you can't get energy from nothing and all of this. Well, fact is we live in an infinite sea of energy. There's nothing but energy. It's just somebody got really smart and figured out how to put a meter on your, on your house and charge you for it. Uh, 
uh, and we haven't been smart enough to actually come up with really efficient ways of taking this energy from the vacuum, the zero point energy. Uh, but all these modalities are pointing into this direction. And this idea of a time reversal wave is simply restoring coherence. So you're taking the cell uh, and disorganized cells and broken DNA and these kind of things and restoring them back. So it's kind of like going back in time to its most coherent thing. And when you're in this field, then the, the cells sort of shift into this coherence that brings them into uh, phase. And so one of the other things that we'll talk about in a bit is the phasing aspect to this. And so what uh, this concept of phase conjugation, uh, if you listen to Dan's talks, uh, it's the premise for uh, a lot of the technologies that uh, he talks about. And basically you can look at phase conjugation as being a unification of opposites. In this case, the phasing is 180 degrees out of phase. So when you have these waveforms, which is this last slide, you get a transverse wave is a certain frequency. So however, the periodicity of these bumps going up and down here is frequency. So these are higher frequencies and these are lower frequencies. And what one tube on the Therify is in one phase, which means it's going up, while the other tube is in another phase, which is going down. So if you combine those two phases, they basically cancel each other out. If they're 180 degrees out of phase, you have plus 10 on one side and minus 10 on the other, and they meet at zero. So right at your Dan Tin, when you're basically lying on the table, the center of your body is where that zero point is. And that's where all the magic happens. It also incorporates these longitudinal waves. And you hear people talk about, you know, in New Age circles, a lot about longitudinal waves and scalar waves and all these kind of things. Uh, the best way to understand a longitudinal wave is that it's like a pressure wave. It's like the sound that's being resonated with my vocal cords is traveling through the air longitudinally. It's resonating with your eardrums and your eardrums are creating a signal that you interpret inside of your head. Uh, so there's a longitudinal component to electricity and that's what the fractal antennas of the plasma are actually producing. So these longitudinal waves as well as the transverse electric waves as well as magnetic fields from the Tesla system are all converging right at the center of your body when you're on that table right at your Dan Chin. And they're all cancelling each other out. They're collapsing. So you're dumping all this power into the body and then it's going into nothing. So where is that energy going? And that's where the scalar component of this whole thing uh, comes in and that's where all, all the magic happens. But we won't get into it too, too deeply. Be and essentially you've got to realize that all our all our perception is very narrow little bandwidths. So we have, you know, with our ears, we can hear from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz or so. Uh, it's a very small uh, bandwidth way down here. Uh, with our eyes, we can see a higher band, but again, it's a very narrow bandwidth right here that we see the, the color, the visible spectrum from ultraviolet to infrared. But when you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, and this is still starting very high at, uh, at radio waves and going very, very high into x-rays. So your cell phone is sitting in here. Uh, your microwave oven is, is running in here. Um, actually, this next slide might show it a bit better. Uh, so all kinds of various different things. Uh, the infrared on your remote control in here and of course very high uh, frequencies like uh, gamma rays, x-rays and then gamma rays from nuclear um, isotopes that are emitting these, these really high frequencies are up here. But this scale, you know, who knows how far it goes. This is just what we've been able to measure with our modern equipment. And this has been a big problem with science when they say, oh, this is junk science. These guys don't know what they're talking about. It has nothing to do with anything. Well, that, they just haven't got the tools to measure it. And so all these people in the past uh, history 
and uh, everybody's been working with this kind of technology's often gotten a bad rap over the years is, and it's it's just that it's ahead of its time most of these ideas like Walter Russell's and what Tesla said to him is like Walter just forget it bury it and it and it's the same thing with free energy and all these things that are really just around the corner it's there it's always been there and the people that have worked on it know it and they've been working on it but they've always been ostracized and criticized for even going there look at Pons and Fleischmann with the original uh, cold fusion uh, ideas, you know, and everybody would just bash those guys and ran them into the ground. Well, now uh, Lockheed Martin's saying, uh, Lockheed Martin is saying, you know, we got uh, fusion generation systems that we're going to be selling people in the next few years that'll be like a little battery. And it won't be long before you're actually carrying around small devices like this, maybe the size of your f cell phone that will be your energy supply for your lifetime. When you're at home, you'll plug it into your house, it'll run your house. When you go out to the car, you'll plug it into your car and you could drive forever. You're never gonna fill up with gas. The whole idea of running on uh, petrol fuels and these kind of things is gonna be so archaic, uh, hopefully within, not <laughs> within a short time. So, uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah, keep going. So we can we can go get into a little bit about the So so what are the frequencies that are, are running in in We've got an hour. Oh, okay. We'll leave time for questions. We'll do questions and stuff like that. Another good half an hour. Okay. All right, so a lot of people ask, well, what's the difference between the Therify and and a Rife machine? Because there's a lot of different Rife type machines on the market today, uh, various different uh, plasma devices as well as the handheld ones, and there's massive libraries of sets of frequencies that target very specifically viruses and bacteria and these kind of things. So what, what I s explain to people is most of the traditional uh, Rife machines are destructive machines. You're targeting a specific frequency to target a specific virus or a specific ailment. And it's much like an opera singer with a wine glass, you're just overpowering the resonant field of that particular microbe or whatever it is, and you literally shatter it like a, like a opera singer with a wine glass. And uh, so you can do this, you can take a, a paramecium or something, and you can put it on a slide under a microscope, much like what Rife was doing. Uh, paramecium's a bit bigger, a critter, so you can, you can see it. Uh, then you can add uh, either electrical contacts on that slide and, and pump different frequencies into it until you see it react. And so these guys are pretty highly modal and they zip around in some pond water or whatever you got on there and you can see them cruise around like that. And then all of a sudden you tune into the, this resonant frequency of it, which Rife called the mortal oscillating rate. And when you target that mortal oscillating rate, you'll see it stop and it'll start to shake and it'll quiver and it'll move around. And then the, the cell wall starts to bubble like this and then all the contents of the cell just spill out onto the slide and it's dead. Uh, so what you've done is you've overpowered it. You found it's what Rife called the mortal oscillating rate. You overpowered it and killed it. So all these Rife machines are destructive tool, tools and they work great. But the difference with the Therify is it's not destructive, it's constructive. So it's not targeting anything and it's not any specific frequency. It's a wide range of frequencies that are all based on uh, the Fibonacci sequence or the, the golden mean. So that golden mean ratio is the, uh, the divisions in the frequencies that are in there. And interestingly enough, they all fall into place when you tie them in with Planck's length, which is what Dan's algorithms does, then all of a sudden you've got the Schumann resonance, you've got uh, alpha, beta, and the theta inside of the brain waves, uh, you've got uh, different resonances in, in color, and all kinds of things align in these, in these harmonics. So what it is in the Therify, it's a very complex waveform that uses uh, these, these uh, frequencies derived from nature. Here, here's another instance on how plants grow. 
so the simple uh, Fibonacci series, which approximates the, the golden uh, mean. It doesn't nail it down. It kind of skips on both sides because you're using rational numbers to do it. So you start with one and you uh, add it to itself. One plus one is two. And then you add the previous number to the next number. Uh, one plus two is three. Uh, two plus three is five. 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on, ad infinitum. And this will go exponentially upwards into this curve. So if you're starting with 1, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we see this, like the Nautilus shell and um, several other things uh, in, in nature, including water loves to conform to these sequences as well. And this has to do with the spin. So. This is another big aspect about the Therify, is that everything in the universe spins, nothing moves in a straight line, and part of this old paradigm of all our mathematics and our technology, and we've gone against nature, and we tried to make things linear, and we try, we try to conceive as time is linear, and all these things, it's like, well, you know, everything starts here and ends there, and it goes from point A to point B. But when you look at the cosmos or you look down in your microscope or anything, and you look closely at anything in nature, there's no straight lines. Everything is constantly in a spin and there's spins within spins within spins and vortices upon vortices upon vortices. And water is the perfect example and so is air. So here's just a simple smoke flare and a plane flying by and just look at these massive vortexes that are created by the plane to give it lift. And you see it in, in weather patterns and in, in whirlpools. You unplug the, your sink and, and here you've got this uh, perfect uh, spiral fields that uh, come into play within water. So water easily moves into these patterns and, and the, all the molecules uh, are structured by this spinning patterns and they form these sort of clathrite uh, cages. So these are the microclusters. When you hear people talk about microclusters in water, and so this is a big part about the alkaline uh, water that everybody's drinking is. However, I've been saying for, I don't know, 20 some odd years that alkaline water, you're not getting the benefits from the minerals and the alkalinity is not about changing the pH. And they got this argument that, oh yeah, uh, cancer won't exist in an alkaline environment, it's always in an acidic environment. Uh, these are conditions within your body. What the benefits you're receiving from alkaline water is the hydrogen that's bound to all those minerals. And in fact, the minerals are doing you more harm because they're watering down your digestive juices in your stomach, the first thing that they do is hit your stomach. If you drink alkaline water for a long time, uh, you mess with the proton pump in your stomach. You want the hydrogen, you don't want the alkaline minerals. Uh, and it's a big thing that the Japanese kind of went crazy with. And, uh, but for years I've, <laughs> I've said it's not, because it, what happens is when you get these clusters and you get these alkaline things, so you get certain ions uh, that move in here. So when you put electricity and water together in electrolysis, uh, you need a catalyst because pure distilled water is not going to move with the electricity. It's just going to sit there. But as soon as you add in salt, let's take common table salt, sodium chloride, what happens is the sodium ions drift over to one side of the, the poles and the chlorine to the other. So you actually bubble off the chlorine gas and, you get, you s and then the water breaks up really easily. So those dipoles, uh, those hydrogens, get pulled apart because those can flex at 100 and uh, their standard uh, baseline is 108 degrees and it can move 15 degrees in each sex in each uh, direction. So you pull hydrogen off to one side and you pull oxygen off to the other and that bubbles out to be what's Brown's gas. You heard people that run their car on water and they got little Brown's gas uh, unit in there or HHO is what they're calling it now. Um, Ewell Brown is kind of the guy who popularized it. Of course, Faraday invented this in the 1800s. He was the first to give the models on how to split water. Uh, so again, none of that is any new technology. 
Uh, so what's happening when you form these microclusters is you get uh, little uh, ions inside of these cages and uh, what you get a lot of hydrogen bond, free hydrogen bonding all around them. And when you're drinking that, then the hydrogen releases in your body and, and that's the health benefits you're getting from the alkaline water. The acid water is really good externally. So the other thing is you want to take uh, so your skin is acidic and every time you're washing your hands with alkaline soap or the, the other big myth that I like to debunk is this, everybody's in the, the sterilization. You see these hand sterilizers everywhere and you sterilize, sterilize, sterilize. Well, A, you're wiping off the natural acidic layer that's on your hands if you're continuously washing with alkaline things. Uh, and, and B, you're only increasing the strength of these microbes because they all adapt and the more uh, antibiotics and the more sterilization and all these things we do as a society just make stronger and stronger bugs and now we got super bugs MRSAs and all these things and staph infections that, that nobody can cure because these things have adapted to everything that we tried to to hit it with so we have to start looking to other technologies to get smart about it and say, oh, okay, how do we disable these things and use more techniques like what Rife was doing, or use more supportive techniques like the Therify to just strengthen and build your immune system because you're the ultimate antibiotic. You're, in a way, you're not. In a way, your, your body is. Your body's in a complete system. But you've got, you know, uh, 10 trillion cells in your body and 9 tri trillion of them aren't human, right? So all your intestinal flora, all the little critters that live all over you that make up what you are, most of your cells are not human cells, they're other things. And they all live in, in harmony, most of them get along together, but they fight and they get out of balance and then you get other foreign bugs come in and throw your body and your whole system out of balance. And that's what you want to be able to keep in check. And most of our problems these days with disease and all this is just because of our environment. And another thing that people bring up a lot of times is uh, electromagnetic uh, pollution and electrosmog and, and they're affected by this electricity. And even some people say, well, this is dangerous because, you know, I bring my little electrosmog meter and look at this, I'm reading like a 10.9 on here. <laughs> Uh, and I say the important thing to understand about that is your body's running and it, in the background of the whole universe and all, everything around you, especially if you go into nature, is kind of like a random static pattern. In the old days when you turned on your old TV and you saw all that static on there when it wasn't connected to the table, those are just the random cosmic rays that are coming all the time. And it's a wide band spectrum of everything. All the noise is going like this. It's white noise is basically what's going on in the background. And your cells are able to function with that. It's very clean and, and there's no particular frequency popping up. And then in your home system, you have the 60 hertz and everybody goes, oh yeah, it's that 60 hertz, that's the bad thing. It's a bad frequency and it makes you sick. It's not really even that. Like, yeah, single frequencies will lock the body into patterns and will throw things off. But what it is more is the noise that's on your system. So every single computer that you plug in, every single television, and nowadays we got so many of these little transformers, you know, for charging your cell phones. Every one of those things makes noise and, tw and tweaks the power factor on your, on your system. So in the end, your whole house is, is a big wired up mass and it all has dirty power on it because of all the electronic things you put in. So that dirty noise on that particular frequency of 60 hertz is what's causing more of the damage than particular frequencies. Because some frequencies, uh, as uh, all the people who've worked with Rife know, uh, target specific things. So just a little bit about frequency and then how shape uh, is frequency. So these are all different resonant nodes and in, in, in uh, electrical theory when we transmit high frequencies in microwaves uh, we call this uh, sort of a, a resonant uh, node so your microwave is a specific dimension 
in order to let those wavelengths bounce around inside of that metal box. And your microwave that's running at uh, 1.2 gigahertz or so, you know, that, that's about uh, 12 centimeters, about that far is the wavelength in it. So lower frequencies are longer wavelengths and really low frequencies are really, really long, like miles and miles long. And it isn't until you get to these high frequencies that you start to get wavelengths like that. So now we're finding, oh yeah, so microwaves uh, are doing damage to internal cells. And the reason why the science has never gone along with this is that, oh yeah, that's BS, that can't exist because those wavelengths are too long to affect the cell. The cell's too small. But what they're not taking into consideration is that through the geometry, you have harmonic nodes. Remember I said everything's fractal and recursive. So these patterns all repeat. And if you set up a, uh, a, a wavelength in this particular uh, length of, of frequency, then you have all the harmonics in there. And then that's when things all start to resonate, especially if you, if you have many cells. So you have a whole schwack of brain cells. Well, you, you definitely have 1.2 gigahertz worth of brain cells in there and then you're on your cell phone and you feel that heating sensation inside of your head. You really are uh, cooking your cells to some extent. So this is uh, Dan uh, Winter, who is uh, my partner in this project. And uh, he's talked for years about geometry and uh, their relationship. And so this is sort of the, the, the basics of it, is the five uh, platonic solids. And uh, Plato, of course, has given uh, credit to the platonic solids. That's why we call them that. Because uh, he first wrote about them, or at least four of them, in his book, uh, Timaeus. And so the ancient Greeks, it was quite common at that time, everybody knew about the tetrahedron. Of course, it's related to fire uh, because it's kind of sharp and pointy. It's one of the most solid objects uh, uh, that you can build things out of because it's sort of the shortest possible points. A triangle is a very strong uh, two-dimensional shape and it's basically four uh, triangles that are in third dimension. So that's why you see girders and cranes and uh, bridges and all these things. They all use these tetrahedronal uh, patterns because they are the strongest uh, shape and it relates to fire. Uh, the octahedron is uh, eight-sided, uh, relates to air. Uh, the hexahedron or the cube is six-sided, relates to earth and the icosahedron relates to water. And remember those water molecules we had up, those clusters of water molecules? They all can form because those bond angles on the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, can all vary in that 15 degree uh, difference. It can form all these patterns. But what they didn't know about at that time, and it was considered sort of the, uh, uh, the secret sort of uh, societies and anybody who was initiated into the mysteries uh, was told about the most uh, powerful uh, platonic solid because it is perfect representation of phi uh, is the dodecahedron and so that represents the spirit or the ether and we see these patterns over and over again and a lot of them uh, correspond to the uh, toroidal fields that we're also generating with the, with the, uh, with the Therify. And so this is the cover of Dan's uh, book, and here's the basically the uh, layout of the algorithm uh, showing all the key frequencies, and they're all published in here. Now recently, uh, just take note of this um, particular diagram is sort of the uh, color spectrum from the infrared to the ultraviolet. And, and note that green is right at the middle of 90 degrees. So if you were to lay this out in a circle. Uh, so Dan's talked a lot about uh, green being 90 degrees. And if you think about nature, and this is another one of the funny quirks that we have. We talk about a green technology and it's green, so it's good for the environment and all this. But because plants are green, but if you think about it, 
plants are everything but green. They're actually rejecting green. That's why they are green, because they're absorbing every other wavelength of light and they reject green. So, so for instance, another new technology that we have uh, that we're using for growing plants is special lights that don't have the bandwidth of green in them. So you can see they're very easy to make with red L uh, LEDs and, and blue LEDs and then you're saving a lot of the power because a lot of the white light that we get, a good amount, portion of that is, is green. So recently, the original tubes, uh, for everybody that's seen the pictures online, there's a lot of the original pink tubes. Uh, that, that I started experimenting with different wavelengths and different gases, with noble gases within those tubes. And the new tubes that have a combination of uh, colors in them are actually uh, 427 and 691 nanometers apart. That gives you that orangey uh, reddish at one end of the tube and the ultraviolet uh, sort of purple at the other. So now we've taken the phase conjugation of the two tubes being phase conjugated and incorporated that into the single tube. So you have the perfect wavelengths of light at phi ratio apart phase conjugated within the fractal of the plasma itself. So that's why the tubes changed color and it's been a bit of an experiment over the last few years. And, you know, the jury's still out on what, uh, you know, I've put every kind of gas you can imagine into them from pure hydrogen, all the noble gases, and nitrogen, even water into these tubes, and uh, been playing with them for a long time. And between those two, they're pretty well everybody agrees that those uh, combinations are, are, are really nice. Some of them are a bit smoother, like when you get gases like uh, xenon and krypton, you know, uh, krypton gas, I paid like $20,000 for a little teeny cylinder of krypton to fill these things with. And uh, it's, a, it's amazing, it's a really rough, ride the krypton is compared to some of these other ones. These ones are designed to be smoother because we want them to be harmonically inclusive and have healing effects rather than the real destructive punch of rife. When I was building rife machines in the early days, I loved those really hard ones because you could whack particular viruses, bacteria instantly with them. But this combination is designed to be a real gentle ride. So this is just some ideas of what Dan calls the, the pine cones kissing. So when you picture the electro uh, transverse electromagnetic waves that are coming off of these, uh, essentially as they get closer to each other in the zero point in the middle, the, the fields diminish until they reach their ultimate zero point inside of the body. <laughs> this is a good slide. So Dan took the caduceus, which again, going back to alchemy and, and Hermes tries magistus, you know, he's always holding that caduceus in his hand with the winged serpents on there, so the two serpents climbing up. So this is the caduceus on its side. It became the, the symbol for the medical uh, association. Of course, they took off one of the serpents, so right away they threw away half of the, half of the pie. And, uh, what uh, in India those two serpents represent is sort of the Ida and the Pingala, the, the pranic breath and the, and the serpents rising in your spine are, are the Kundalini. So as you're doing your uh, yogic practices, you're in training your body to bring the Kundalini from the seed that's coiled up at the base of your spine uh, to rise up through your chakras, activating each of the chakras on the way until you become a little bit more enlightened as they work up. And then these are working on your other bodies. So your other bodies, you know, like we say, well, we have the physical body, uh, mental body, emotional body. Uh, your chakras can be seen as uh, other bodies that are connected to you. And as these energies, uh, and it has a lot to do with the spinal cranial uh, pump in your in your fluids in your spine and many people that work with uh, cranial sacral uh, work immediately fell in love 
with the Therify when we first introduced it and they were watching very closely to see that people went into that still point uh, automatically like normally it would take them I don't know if anybody's a practitioner here but it takes a few treatments and a lot of sessions to get people to go into that still point where they just hold the back of your neck uh, but they're saying uh, that instantly when the Therify turns on they're watching the neck on people on the table they're like holy smokes the machine is putting them into the still point and we spend all this time working with them to get them to that and uh, well, that's one of the common things that uh, most people experience on there is that uh, a lot of times I get people say you know I go on these meditation retreats for a week and I come on the Therify for three minutes and I feel like I've been at one of these meditation retreats for a, a whole week so they instantly go into this sort of Zen state you might want to back off a bit while the uh, well, the tubes are on, <coughs> Mr. Photographer, yeah, back, <laughs> sorry. So, okay, well, if your camera is good, if your camera can handle it. The other thing is this works on very high potentials. What's interesting, you remember Tesla with all the plasmas and all that? This plasma is generated, it's between 150 to 300,000 volts coming to these tubes. And a lot of people go, oh my God, that's just terrible. You could die, you could be like the electric chair. Well it's actually not the voltage that causes damage it's the current so when you grab onto your power uh, socket here and grab 120 volts and, and that's not much voltage well why will it stop your heart in half a second and, and you can die quite easily from it but this is not harming anybody uh, there's no current in here <coughs> so it's a very high voltage potential and very high voltages but the current is next to nothing and it's the current that does the damage. It's the current that they're building up when they got that heart respirator you see on TV and then boom, bring people back to life. They're driving a lot of current to their heart through these big capacitors. So in essence, it's safe, but at the same time, it, it will still might mess with your camera if your camera's too close. Or if you touch it, you get a funny tingle. The electricity is a different kind of electricity. It's what we call cold electricity. And it actually is moving through these very thin wires. And the other thing people say, well, how can the wires be that thin for that much electricity? It's a field effect. It's actually a, a charge cloud that's around the device. It isn't, electricity doesn't really move through wires. That's why they make stranded wires, because the electrons like to go to the outer edge of the, of the wires. And in, in a high potential like this, they actually form a cloud of charge around the wires and that cloud is what's activating the plasma so if you get too close to it and you see that electricity crawls out and it feels really weird it's like a caterpillar that kind of crawls around your hand and it'll turn from the cold electricity to the hot electricity and it will give you sort of a what we call an RF burn or a little bit of a burn but essentially it's not it's not painful and it won't kill you and it's it's somewhat uh, harmless <laughs> So this is another character in history that uh, talked a lot about spin, spintronics. His name was Nikolai Kozirev, and he's a Russian astrophysicist. And he did a lot of observation of the cosmos and talked a lot about spin and the nature of how everything in nature spins from the, you know, the looking at the arms on the galaxy, everything's moving in these spirals all the way down to uh, subatomic particles, the stuff they're playing with at CERN. If you were to take a picture of any movement of these things, that's why it's in a big toroidal ring, because they speed up these uh, pieces of matter that are smaller than uh, atoms, and they whip them around this thing, and they watch how they observe. And as soon as you let them go into free space, they spin into these little zings and then disappear. So they can pop in and out of existence, and they're always in these spiraling motions and, and Cozy Rev did a lot of research with that and uh, came up with these <coughs> ideas of spintronics and it gets into a lot of complicated stuff like angular momentum and all these crazy things but when we start to look at matter we understand that matter can exist in all these different states maybe some of you've heard of things like Ormus or white powdered gold and how they're in these uh, quantum entangled uh, super deformed nuclei and it has a lot to do with these spin states of this of matter 
So many of the, if you haven't heard about it, it's basically you can take a lot of the elements on the periodic table, especially in the platinum metal group, and you can condition them such that the nucleus becomes deformed and they no longer behave like metals. So you can take gold, and this was an alchemical procedure, and you basically turn it into uh, this super deformed nuclei and the gold falls apart and turns into this white powder that some people call monatomic gold, but it's the really small clusters. Uh, they don't behave like a regular metal. Can't melt them back together to be like a gold ring or anything like that anymore. But what you can do is you can eat it. <laughs> and so a fellow came on the scene a while ago named David Hudson and he started touting the properties of eating this white powdered gold and how it would super basically attach on to the ends of your DNA, turn your DNA into superconductors and you get this sort of instant enlightenment. Uh, you start to converse with angels and uh, all kinds of crazy things start happening. Uh, so a lot of people really got into that over the years and a lot of those things can be explained through uh, the spintronics and angular momentum. We won't get into it now. How many slides do you have? It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we'll get a few questions in. So basically, I just want to finish it off with explaining the spin that's happening here because there's all kinds of spin fields that are happening in the Therify. Each one of the electrodes spins in on itself, and then there's three electrodes that come in, and they all spin uh, into the tangentially on the tube and then they spin in these angles so they braid on a braid on a braid. So it creates these huge spinning vortexes within vortexes like this, and then these big toroidal fields around each one of the tubes. And uh, I'll just show one last video of them. So I, I've actually filmed it where I've s slowed them down and you can really see the spins in here because I've had a few people email me and stuff. There's no such thing. It can't spin. That's impossible and all this stuff. So I'll just. Uh, do you see that? So this will uh, give you an idea of how the spin because you can play around and tweak it to get it really spinning well. So you can see. And this is the new shape of the, Roger has the very first version of the tubes, this is the new shape of the tubes. But the electrodes are spinning, each one is spinning in like this. And then I'll go around to the face and you'll see the big spin within the, within the tube itself. <coughs> so many of these different principles are all incorporated into one machine for the first time. I've, there's nothing, I've you know, been studying all this stuff for many years. And the whole idea of building the Therify was to integrate all these different concepts that people have had single machines that do a magnetic pulse or they do a spinning uh, massage kind of thing or uh, a plasma in a single tube. Uh, this is the first machine of its kind to basically integrate all these things that we've been talking about tonight uh, and much more <laughs> into one actual uh, device. So that's what makes it kind of kind of unique like that. So, fun stuff. And then these new tubes, just to mention the last thing, are all uh, new geometries. They're all based on the Russian uh, pyramid angles. Uh, 72 degree angle on these cones. And when the Russians made pyramids and put them in their fields, they found that the agricultural things just went ballistic. Everything grows really crazy. And so the tube, the new vortex is basically in the same uh, dimensions as the Russian uh, pyramids. And this is what's happening inside a pyramid, is it's conditioning space to spin in, in, in the same vortex. So that's uh, the, the basis behind the Therify in a nutshell. <laughs>